Welcome to the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University under the Robotic Process Automation Initiative at the Center for Business Civic Engagement. A lot to say, but basically, welcome to the webinar. I am delighted to introduce our special guest today, John Ovesek, the Chief Operating Officer of the Virginia Information Technologies Agency for the Commonwealth. He became Vita's first COO on August 10th, 2019, and he's done an amazing job since then, as we'll learn today. As COO, he leads enterprise IT services, service delivery, operations, supply chain management, customer success, investment governance, project management, and finance, a big portfolio, which hopefully John will also get into. He specializes as a turnaround and transformational executive with a proprietary methodology that delivers measurable outcomes rapidly. This methodology has delivered quantifiable top and bottom line improvements ranging from a value of about 8 million to around a value of 200 million within a range of one to two years. In addition, Jonathan is a, has a penchant for research, development, and innovation, and a specialty in artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, and machine learning. Joining me today is the RPA Initiative co-founder, Doran Montagnu. Let's turn it over to John, who wants to share some thoughts, and then we'll have a conversation. So, John, why don't I give you sl the slide share, and why don't you take it away? And we're delighted to have you with us today. Absolutely, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm excited to share some of the very exciting things we're doing in terms of technology in the Commonwealth. And what I'll do now, I'm going to share my screen with you all, and I'm just going to go over a brief slideshow, which will talk about the technology transformation. And then what we'll do is uh, I'll provide any insight into questions and things like that. But needless to say, to begin, it's a very exciting time to be in Virginia. Um, as was said in the opening, I was brought on to Vita um, a little over two years ago to really drive a technology transformation within the Commonwealth. And to start off with, what is Vita? Well, Vita is the enterprise centralized IT agency for the state. So your executive branch agencies like your Department of Education and your Department of Health and the Virginia State Police are some of our customers, which we provide technology solutions and support for. As you can see, my customers are 65 state agencies. So I have a diverse number of customers and you know, different focuses, different missions, et cetera. And overall, we service about 55,000 state employees who provide services to 8.6 million plus Virginia residents. We've won a number of awards, particularly in the last two and a half years, recognizing our efforts and the outcomes that have been delivered. And we have something here that they brought me in to sort of stabilize and really optimize called a multi-supplier model. And what that means is we have the capability, and we'll talk about this when I talk about the transformation, but we have the capability to really identify solutions that we need and then plug and play different best in breed suppliers and vendors to really help us meet the need that we're trying to achieve during that time. And there's only three of these things in the nation right now, although my prediction is that based on the success that we've experienced with the multi-supplier model, you're going to see a lot more of this in the future. Um, in fact, I, I talked to a lot of state executives and they're interested in the, how to implement this, but right now we're one of three. And the other two are Texas and Georgia. And then as part of this transformation, one of the things we did is we said, not only is it what we do, but we have to embed a culture change and a focus in our DNA. So you can see here our mission statement, which is not you know, normal for, I would say, state IT to really talk about delivering innov you know, innovative services and also effective outcomes and results. And the reason I'm highlighting that is this is gonna be a recurring theme when we talk about some of the technology transformation activities we've been doing, as well as some of the services we've been implementing, one of which um, RPA as a service first of the kind in the nation, as well as artificial intelligence as a service, which is something we're looking to implement very, very soon. So before I talk about that, though, let me set the table 
into just what the state is of technology in the public sector, uh, in particular at the state level. So as it was said in the opening, my entire experience up to about two and a half years ago was in the private sector. I've done high level um, private equity work. I've done high level turnaround and transformation work. I have a hands-on experience with technology and artificial intelligence in the private sector. So it was a very robust type of experience. So when they brought me in to Vita to do the transformation in the Commonwealth of Virginia, part of my thing was to say, let's analyze what the current state is of technology. What are the things I have to change tactically, but also how do I change hearts and minds? How do I challenge organizational inertia and things to that effect? So what are some barriers that I experienced and observed when I sort of was brought on board at Vita back in August of 2019? Well, first and foremost, they really perceive technology and we're changing that perception, but this is definitely the baseline perception. They perceive technology to be a cost center and an expense. So they don't perceive it to be something that's valuable, something that can drive an outcome. And that's a big part of what you're going to see with the transformation I show you very, very soon is we're aiming to change that perception and influence that perception. Uh, secondly, extensive reliance on legacy technologies. What this means is very old applications. We're talking 20 plus year old applications, uh, including mainframe type of technologies. And why this is a problem is the older these applications get, the more expensive they get to support and the less sustainable, not only does that particular agency become, the more they rely on these old legacy systems, but the more costly it is to the taxpayer. So this is a very important part of us addressing this as part of the transformation. Next, the funding models in government are not conducive like they are in the private sector to really just experiment and innovate and to implement sort of new technologies rapidly. And what I mean by that is in the private sector, I've done R&D, for example. In particular, I've done it in the SaaS last mile logistics space, as well as the medical device space, I'm heavily involved in research and development. As part of those activities, I would have some part of my budget called basically seed capital. I can invest in different things, see what lessons we can learn, and then use that to ultimately improve the R&D function which I was running. In the public sector, it's quite a bit different. You don't really have that ability to get seed capital to invest in things. So that is something that once you see the services that we've launched and how we've launched them, you'll understand why we've designed the way that we did to really address this particular barrier. Next, there's a lack of incentivization to take risk. And what that means is the natural incentive in the public sector, particularly in state government, is to really just you know, sort of keep the lights on, operate well, keep things safe and secure, but really don't push the envelope too much because if you do, you, if you win, if you get a great outcome, that's great, but what is the reward, right? Versus the private sector, whereas if I decide to really push and get an amazing outcome, I may get a bonus. I may get my name on a patent. Um, there's all a bunch of incentives I have to take risk and controlled risk in the private sector versus the public sector. And then lastly, um, there's not like, depending on where you talk, there's pockets of very high level technological expertise in government, but there's not a broad level of like, th there's pockets of basically not modern technology experience and expertise among, amongst a lot of the technology resources and staff. So that is also something you have to consider when driving a technology transformation in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So what is the transformation quite simply that we're pushing in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Well, I'd like to say as a transformation executive, I try to make things as simple as possible, right? There's a lot of details and a lot of interdependencies and sort of like a spider web almost of uh, interdependencies between the projects and the deliverables in these four phases, but at the simplest, simplest levels, you have four phases. Phase one, we typically, Vita has been responsible for, for providing core technology services to the Commonwealth, um, to those 65 state agencies that I mentioned earlier. And what does that mean? Um, that means your servers, that means your network, that means your phones, things to this effect. Um, typically, I would like to call these, you know, if you think about it like a utility, 
these are typically your utility type of technology services, right? We're basically like the Dominion Energy of the state government, right? So what we had to do is we had to stabilize these core services and really make sure they were highly available, highly secure and perform very well to build enough credibility to proceed to phase two. And what is phase two? And, and this is a big part of what we're going to talk about today. The introduction of modern technology services that are accretive to value. And this is a key point. If you remember what I said, laying the sort of table of the state of technology in the public sector, there's really not a perception that technology is basically an enabler of a strategic outcome and can really be a game changer to help you deliver those outcomes more effectively, more efficiently, et cetera. So what you have to do to solve that is you have to come up with a mix of services that has a direct correlation to the bottom line. And then you have to be able to espouse that so they understand that and you just keep hammering it at home until they understand how this technology drives an outcome for them. And to give you a clear example of this, I'll, I'll give you an example that everybody here should be able to you know, understand um, irrespective of their technology background and experience. So, you know, at your homes and at your offices, you have something called an internet service provider, an ISP, right? It can be Verizon Fios, it can be Comcast, um, it can be Cox, right? You're all familiar with these names and these big companies that do it. Um, so if I asked you, how would you rate your internet service provider, right? Typical consumer behavior is that you would rate them quite low. Um, because the, the normal consumer behavior is that these utility type services, um, you really take them for granted and you want to have them cheaper and cheaper, even though you need them to run the other services. So there's a concept in the private sector called net promoter score, right? And it's a, it's a scoring from negative 100 to positive 100, right? The higher up you are, the more sort of positive your customers are the more your customers are willing to espouse and really be evangelists for your brand. And then obviously the inverse is also true. The more negative you are, you have detractors of your brand, right? So if you take an ISP, an internet service provider, you can, be, you, you can basically have the best customer service. You can have the best customer success people. And the range of the net promoter score for the internet service provider is negative 16 to positive 19. And what that means is, even if you devote all those resources to customer service, you basically, the best you can hope for is a low to neutral rating and net promoter score, right? Now, let me draw a comparison for you. So that's, that's the net promoter score for an ISP. If I, if I said to you the net promoter score of Apple, for example, is, a, you know, it, it ranges from the high 60s to mid 70s, right? So very, very high. Similar to Amazon, it's typically to the mid to high 60s right? Why is the net promoter score for Apple and Amazon that much higher than the ISP? You need the ISP to run the devices from Apple, to run the Amazon web services, the Amazon sort of uh, platform. You need the internet to run that, but yet people value the Apples and the Amazons of the world far more in their perception than they value your internet service provider, right? So this was, this phase is really touching at that. This is saying that, you know, we understand consumer psychology. These are our customers, the state agencies, and we are, we have to implement solutions that are higher up on that NPS scale than your typical phase one um, core infrastructure services. Phase three, optimization of business model. What this means is we're always looking to continually improve. Um, this also means that like not only make services more cost effective for our customers, so they're not prohibitive to consumption and really taking uh, taxpayer dollars into account, but that also means that we take our own medicine. So when we talk about introducing modern technology services like RPA, like artificial intelligence, we're going to use these things in our own internal Vita processes and systems to optimize our business model as well. And then lastly, we do all these phases well, what is the mind space that we wanna be in the minds of the key people in state government in Virginia and our customers and our customer agencies? We wanna be the preeminent state technology, uh, strategic technology advisor and partner 
what that means is ultimately the uh, levels of engagement will be, we have, you know, a need partner with Vita early, and we will, you know, advise of, of you a very good solution that will meet your needs and really help you achieve those business outcomes. And, and that's ultimately how this all sort of fits together. So today, the, the really most of the focus of today's conversation will be on the modern services part of this, right? And I, I just explained to you the whole psychology part of really focusing on this as part of our strategy. Um, but we really are focused on these modern technology services that can be directly attributable to a business outcome. And that's the key. If I, you know, if I said to you, like you buy a laptop or you buy a server, right? What business outcome did you achieve? Not really anything. You could do anything with a laptop or server. That, that's infrastructure, right? But if I said to you, we spent $50,000 on robotic process automation and we saved two hundred dollars to $300,000, on that $50,000 spend, that's a much easier sort of business case to make. And that's much easier in the mind of our customers and really much easier to evangelize that type of benefit. So that's really the key of why Vita as part of this transformation is heavily, heavily focused on the modern services aspect. And we'll talk a little bit about RPA as a service. Um, we'll mention AI as a service. And the cool thing about these two services the RPA one we launched formally in July of uh, this year, the first of its kind in the nation, the first of its kind end-to-end -end robotic product, uh, process automation service in the nation, right? So Virginia is doing a lot of things that nobody has ever done before, which is pretty amazing. And then AI as a service, we're currently standing up pilots and we're going to formally launch the service in the first quarter of the 2022. So this will also be the first of its kind in the nation. And then we mention other modern services like low code application platform and SD-WAN. So what are some elements when we talk about either RPA as a service and AI as a service, right? And again, taking it all back, remember what I said about some of the sort of background information of technology in the public sector and state government, right? You don't have an incentive to take a risk, right? You may not fully be able to, you know, articulate a reason why you need to make this investment. The, the, the financial structures are not as easy to make the investment as they are in the private sector, right? So what I seek to do with these type of services, as I said, I can design the process to really, you know, eliminate a lot of the variables and the outcomes and really and have a greater probability of success in deploying these solutions. And these are some key elements of it. Like, for example, one of the barriers, um, particular for robotic process automation and artificial intelligence, that one would experience, whether it's uh, private sector or public sector, is that you can basically pick the wrong process to automate, right? And if you don't know technology that well, like I said, not every state agency that's my customer knows technology that well. Um, if you pick the wrong process to automate, you've just wasted taxpayer money in trying to automate that process. The return on investment isn't there. Well, we decide to sort of go in there and before we even let you consume the service, we're gonna do an upfront process analysis in your ecosystem. And we're gonna identify for you, you being the customer, the greatest targets of opportunity, the greatest return on investment uh, opportunities in your environment. So that takes out that variable and whether you're going to achieve the success with the technology. And what's another potential um, issue that you may have in deploying these technologies? Well, let's say that you pick the right process, but then you don't partner with the right developers. Um, so you basically try to go as cheap as you can, get a developer off of Fiverr or, you know, one of these freelance things and they don't develop the bots or the AI solution correctly and you deploy it and you don't ultimately see the benefits that you thought you were going to get from the intake process. Well, what we've done as a, an element of the service design is that we've really come together with an army of certified, in the case of RPA, certified bot developers with UiPath, who is an excellent partner. Their platform is excellent. Um, you know, and based on demand, 
the, the, the sort of army of developers can either scale up or scale down, but we have them under contract ready to go. So we take out that variable. And then lastly, and this is a common element of both services that we're designing, um, is a center of excellence. In my opinion, just doing services in the private sector and you know doing different commercial aspects in the private sector, um, you really have to have a mechanism of your service delivery that has some elements of continuous learning and continuous improvement, right? So this center of excellence is designed to monitor the service, monitor feedback from the customers, make adjustments, but then also to sort of say, like for example, with RPA, we capture all of the RPA implementations we've done, right? So for example, let's say we've done an RPA uh, implementation for agency one for a specific use case, right? We do an intake process. It looks like that's very similar to a use case we've already implemented. So when we bring this technology to the customer, we basically speed up the implementation because we already have the bot developed. That's part of the center of excellence, right? So that means that out of your investment, you get the return on investment much earlier you have a much better payback period. And in the, it's a much more attractive success story for the technology you're looking to deploy. And then lastly, one of the things I've noticed, and this is true in the public and private sector, but I guess in the public sector, this is probably a little bit more prevalent in, the, uh, in there than, than in the private sector, is that the public sector, when they do some of these technology implementations, they're not always great or consistent at capturing what this outcome was achieved from implementing this technology. And what do I mean by that? Well, that means you actually have to do the groundwork to say, if I'm gonna automate this accounting process, what was the baseline level of performance before I implemented the automation, <laughs> right? And then, you know, when you capture the baseline level of performance, right? Then I implemented X, I monitored the implementation to make sure it was stabilized. What was the quantifiable improvement, whether it's a productivity improvement, whether it's a cost reduction, whether it's a waste reduction that was implemented by the technology. So number one, you capture that. And then number two, you really make sure that you're very external in basically evangelizing that to the key stakeholders in government, to your customers and things like that. So they can also evangelize the benefits, right? So this is something that's baked into the service that we've designed. It's, it's really have that. Because as I've said, you know, we talk about the transformation. A big part of the transformation is overcoming organizational inertia in state government and driving a culture change. So going from a culture change where technology is just a line item on a budget to where technology is viewed, and in, in Virginia we're seeing it, as a very critical strategic enabler of a business outcome. And now it's starting to happen based on these type of design elements. And then this is just a little bit of an idea when we rolled the first version of the RPA as a service, what are some in scope use cases that we designed it around, right? And we, we obviously, as part of the design, we have service evolution as part of this whole thing. So we have future um, enhancements that we're making to the service based on what we're seeing in the Commonwealth. But we focused on financial reporting and analysis data entry and migration, benefits and claims processing review, document processing, and then fraud, waste, and abuse detection. So the one thing you'll notice, we were very strategic in what we picked. Each one of these elements, it's not like, it's not ambiguous to tie it to a business outcome, right? So for example, fraud, waste, and abuse. I can show you that implementing this fraud, waste, and abuse robot saved us and detected X right? It's not questionable. It's not, it's not ambiguous. It's something that's clear and easily understood. Same thing with benefits and claims processing. Um, you can easily capture the productivity of the process before automation and then post automation. So we were very deliberate in selecting these in scope use cases to really make sure that, you know, we are having something that does lend itself well to really evangelizing the benefit of the technology. And then I'd like to share with you, and this is something that was very exciting, um, some critical business outcomes that we've achieved through our RPA as a service. And what's exciting about this is not only is it exciting because I'm an evangelist of technology and I love it when it works, right? Um, but it's also like, you know, our job in state government is to really 
really play our fiduciary responsibility and make sure we're doing the right thing by the taxpayer dollars and making sure we're being as efficient as we possibly can in how we spend them and how we process. So these are some very critical outcomes that not only serve the Commonwealth a very great benefit, but it also served the taxpayer a very great benefit. So the first one is for my own agency. So as part of VITA, we oversee <laughs> about a billion dollars of technology uh, contracts. So, you know, we're, we're overseeing a huge amount of technology spend. And um, I have a very uh, high skilled finance team. Um, th some of the best analytical minds in state government work for me. And, um, you know, the way the process was before is that they would have to manually, these supplier invoices would come in. They would have to manually tie the line items out from the quantity to the rate to the contract, make sure that's acceptable, and then ultimately give a yay or nay decision on the audit and whether we can pay the invoice, right? Now, while that's a critical function, right, we need to make sure that the monies are being spent appropriately. We need to be very ju uh, judicious in how we spend taxpayer dollars. Is that the most beneficial usage of my financial analyst time to manually be reconciling an invoice to a contract to, you know, and really doing that manual reconciliation? I would argue no. So what we did is we sat the developers down with them to really first show them how they do the reconciliation today, right? And the developer took notes and they said, okay, I can automate this, this, and this. So it took about 16 hours to develop the script for the monthly uh, vendor technology invoice audit function. And then what we noticed is upon deploying it, accuracy improved immediately. So you had no longer have you had errors because now it's systematic. So it's either systematically right or systematically wrong, but you don't have that element of like, if I'm manually doing this, my eyes are tired, right? Now I'm like, I, I missed a number or whatever. The accuracy improved immediately, but the productivity improvement is estimated in, in the hundreds of analyst hours saved. So what that means for me as a leader in state government is that I can redesign these financial analysts to do higher level tasks and to add much more value to the Commonwealth because now they're not in the tedious manual tasks. They're gonna be able to use their analytical skills, their forecasting skills and things like that to really facilitate much more effective risk management and decision-making for the Commonwealth. And then this next one is a very exciting story as well. Um, as you all know, during the pandemic, uh, you know, there was an unemployment issue across the country, right? Um, you, you had a lot of jobs disrupted with stay-at-home orders and, and different types of situations. So you had a lot more citizens in every state of the country demanding more and more unemployment benefits, right? So what we did here is we benchmarked the unemployment process as it existed. And then with the automations, what that has delivered for the Commonwealth. So as you can see here, um, you know, we've clocked the transactions. So you have five minutes for a human to do these transactions, given the state of the process, 12 seconds with the RPA, 12 seconds with the bot, massive improvement. And then, you know, the next one is regarding throughput. A person could do 120 files and, and a file would be a person submits a case. You have to analyze the case and do X, Y, and Z. So a person could do 120 files in about 10 hours, right? So that, that's, again, current baseline assessment. Um, with RPA, they can do it in 24 minutes. Immediate throughput enhancement, immediate benefit to the citizen, um, you know, more effective in their mission to the citizen through this technology. And the reduction of the unemployment insurance backlog just tied to just this technology was approximately 40%. Um, so this was a very good win um, for us to really demonstrate the power of the technology and what it can do for state government and particularly for the mission to the citizen. And then lastly, and we have a lot more stories, but I figured I'd highlight these three. Um, as you're all familiar, you know, COVID sort of hit us March of last year. We had the state of emergency. And then the health departments all across the country we're really having to sort of have their analysts staff up and monitor COVID outbreaks off different areas of their states, right? So what you had in the Department of Health was a manual process where these lab reports for all the testing results would be funneled into them. And what they would normally do is, you know, you'd have analysts looking at these reports, 
taking the numbers, compiling them, aggregating them. And then ultimately that would populate not only the COVID outbreak dashboards, but that would also feed its way into uh, decision-making and COVID and public health response based on what you're seeing with the uh, pandemic outbreak results. Well, what we said here is that, do we need an analyst to do all that? You know, um, COVID, you know, you need to have a much more proactive public health posture. Virginia did an outstanding job in this area, partly due to a, a, an excellent Department of Health and partly due to implementation of this technology. So what we did is we implemented RPA to really, as sort of like a funnel, to take into account thousands of lab reports across the state. We aggregated them, we digitized them, and then we ultimately fed them into a reporting layer. And we increased data availability by approximately 7,000% in addition to just lightning fast speed comparing to the prior state of the process. So this really did facilitate much more effective decision-making at multiple levels of government, as well as a much more proactive public health posture, which really served a benefit to the citizens. So this is RPA. I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. So there's a reason that you know, we did RPA before we did artificial intelligence, right? And I know we have some non-technical folks on the call, so I'm not gonna get too technical, depending on the questions that come up, I'll, uh, I'll scale it up or down as needed. Um, artificial intelligence represents a transformational opportunity for massive amounts of optimization, massive amounts of productivity improvements, and massive amounts of cost savings through more effective work design across every state. Um, now, artificial intelligence, th the reason we started off with RPA is because it's much more easy to implement, it's much less expensive, and we had to validate that the RPA as a service worked before we moved on to AI as a service, right? But you can see here, through just a macro level analysis from De Deloitte, of how many potential savings they can see across an entire sort of organization and across an entire sort of macro sense of multiple organizations. This represents an opportunity to really not only save massive amounts of money, but to really design a lot of people's work towards higher and higher level tasks, similar to RPA, but on a much higher level. Um, and then what I will talk about, you know, to close out before we go into questions, is that you know we have scoped out the RPA as a service, and we now and it's live, and we have scoped out the artificial intelligence as a service, and we're standing up proof of value exercises across Vita as well as some of our customers to prove the value of the service, and then ultimately to roll it into production. But here, here are some areas we're targeting, and these are level two artificial intelligence and above, right? Resource allocation. So one of the resource cases we've identified, um, if you think about like your experience with the DMV, right? In Virginia, uh, you go to the customer service centers, the CSEs, you may have to wait in line. They may be understaffed at that day. You know what I mean? Or, you know, not able to, like depending on what transaction you have to do, it may not be the most, you know, optimal time to go. What we can do is we can take in massive amounts of data and we can take in to account seasonality and really say, for example, to the Department of Motor Vehicles, as well as other agencies that have citizen facing functions like that, is to say, you really want to staff more on a Wednesday and a Wednesday in December versus a Wednesday in January. And we can show a high degree of predictability on this type of resource allocation and forecast based on artificial intelligence tools applied to your historical suite of data. It allows for much more effective resource allocation. Um, citizen interac interaction chat. You know, what we're pushing towards is similar in the private sector. Um, many more mechanisms of digital interaction. Like for example, if you're filing unemployment insurance claims, do you always need to talk to a person? Do you want to always be on hold? Or is there ways to sort of automate a lot of these interactions to get you a really good outcome as a citizen in a much faster manner? Th these are some of the use cases that we're going to be implementing. Um, predictive analytics and forecasting. I, I think that one is very much tied to also decision support. You know, like for me, I'll just use an example of what we're implementing at Vita. So I have a whole suite of operations data across all across the Commonwealth different systems, 
um, you know, different architectures all across the board. And there's all these interdependencies between these different technology elements, right? What if I had a mechanism without me having to manually do this sort of data analysis to really analyze different elements of my technology stack and then draw my attention and say, John, there's a potential problem looming here. Look into it. Myself as an executive, not only does that save me a ton of time, but that also does allow me to manage this model and evolve this model much more effectively. It guides my risk management processes. It guides my issue management processes. Um, so these are some of the you know, very critical um, use cases that we're targeting for V1, version one of the service. And we are confident that you know, if we're able to come back here and, and also share some of the benefits that this service delivers to the Commonwealth, we'll be happy to share those stories with you and give you the numbers behind it. Um, so that concludes at least my initial presentation. Um, I'd like to sort of open it up to any you know, questions or what everybody might have to, to sort of discuss. David, I think, I think uh, you have to amuse yourself. So I was going to say, John, as a Commonwealth citizen, I really appreciate all you're doing to deliver higher value for taxpayers and citizens and all the great work you've showed us today. Um, when did you first kind of come across this or is it in your DNA as a change person to think about using systems to supplement or augment labor? So, you know, I, I've been a technologist for the better part of 20 years um, prior to coming to the Commonwealth. So technology and using that as one of the mechanisms in which I optimize an organization has been something that, you know, again, it's one of the ways you can transform an organization if you understand how to properly sort of blend the technology part of it, as well as the organizational design optimization. So this is something that I've had um, hands-on experience with, certainly not in the public sector before coming here. Um, but this is also just to tie to something specific. I mentioned my AI experience. Um, with RPA, this is something that I've done myself hands-on back in even as early as I was just thinking about this before the, the, um, the webinar, um, I think as early as like 2007. Um, oh, I was wow. working for uh, a hospitality company as an international finance manager, and I designed a whole suite of automations to automate the monthly financial close process. So each closing cycle, we would save ourselves 30 hours from the prior process, for example. So my, my knowledge and my experience of the outcomes that a technology like this can deliver has only grown since that time from the limited bots that I used to deploy. So yeah, th this has definitely been, you know, it's been part of my DNA and part of the way I look to transform organizations. Excellent, excellent. And I know that Virginia is the first, we're gonna go to the chat box in just a few seconds. So feel free to type in your questions if you have questions for John, but since you're one of the first states that have done kind of an end-to-end -end service process, what would you advise other states to do who are maybe looking around going, got to use RPA, we have to improve our technology? What are the things that you would suggest they follow? Well, uh, and I think this is why, you know, this is why I sort of laid out the background early in my presentation. What are some barriers to technology adoption in the public sector, right? And one of them is, um, you know, the perception that technology is really a cost center and a line item on a budget, right? So for other states, I mean, again, I think the model that we've designed here, and this is why I'm happy to go to different national meetings as well as this to espouse the benefits of, you know, the way we've designed the service. I think it actually can be applied to many states. Um, we're not doing it in a proprietary manner. We're willing to share our, the way we've done it. But what they ultimately have to do is, so I've given you the process of, you know, how we've done it with the intake process and then the scalable army of developers and the center of excellence and things like that. But they also have to really focus on capturing the value proposition of why this is important and start influencing the um, organizational inertia 
and the decision makers, right? So, you know, to give an example in Virginia, and, and again, we had that organizational inertia, so I'm speaking from firsthand experience. You know, what you have to do is you have to get some wins under your belt. So the first thing I said is, you know, there was a need with the Department of Health. Their CIO is a friend of mine and a very technology oriented individual. He, he said, you know, we're having this need during the pandemic. Could we implement this technology? I said, yes, but under one condition. If we implement the technology, you have to give me a testimonial. You know, you have <laughs> to give me a testimonial for it. So I'm not the only one saying this in like an echo chamber. You have to, you know, you have to be able to do yeah. that. So, you know, he implemented it there. Uh, Vita implemented it in our financial area, accounts payable. And we've shown a very clear quantitative benefit. So we took these white papers, we took these use cases, and we engaged in a heavy internal marketing effort, right? So we have these meetings with our customers. We have different um, communication channels we send out, whether it's like webinars, videos, um, you know, as well as just your standard like marketing type of emails. And we really started just bombarding them with like the benefits of these things. And then not only that, um, firsthand testimonials from our customers to say, this is what the technology has done for me. And, you know, the real key is if you, you know, you, you have the outcomes to back it up. So that's the key. Number one, make sure you, you know, not smoke and mirrors, make sure you actually have the back, uh, the outcomes to back it up. But number two, really focus on the message and keep reinforcing that message. And eventually these other sort of uh, customers, these other state agencies will come on board because if they see these other agencies being successful with it, and then giving a testimonial, pretty soon they say, I have a similar business problem or I want to share in this success. And then you've proven out the service and they're much more willing to try and consume the technology. Yeah, and it's not so overwhelming because they can say, if he can do it or she can do it, I can do it too. Correct, correct. Yeah. And that's the thing, like for, for us, I say, if we can't find like a pilot customer for this, then I say, I look at Vita and I say, okay, guys, we're going to take our own medicine. If we, <laughs> if we, can't, get, if we can't get that first case, we're going to be the first case. Yeah. Excellent. Dornan, do you want to go to some of the chat box questions? Uh, of course. But uh, first, please, uh, just, John, allow me to commend you for having such a, uh, uh, you know, great mindset of how to best steward our taxpayer money. So kudos to that. And please keep up the good, uh, the good work. Uh, yeah. But how about before we go to, the, to, to that uh, question, um, I'm just curious of one thing, if I may ask, and then we go to, to, to the chat back question. Um, our research paper <clears throat> titled The Promise of RPA for the Public Sector, which was published uh, a couple months ago, revealed that RPA has been gaining momentum at the state and local level in the past 12 months. Um, now, what, would you mind just, I'm curious, what other types of constituent practical benefits were you able to produce between the, beyond the ones that you highlighted earlier, um, you know, like cost savings, um, time savings or accuracy, and how were you able to communicate uh, uh, these and how did the constituents of Virginia responded to it? So in Virginia, we've done our own internal marketing effort. Now, what we've done in Virginia to sort of pull apart this question in multiple layers. What we've done in Virginia is really rely on the customers, at least directly to the citizens to tell their own story. So allow the customer agencies, whether it be the Department of Health, because you know part of the whole idea of the service, and this is also one of the ways we really gear adoption. When we implement the service, we have the win with the VEC, we have the win with the Department of Health, right? It's not our win, like it's not Vita, like oh, Vita just did this, it's not our win. They actually share in the win. So part of what we do with that center of excellence is we capture the business outcome that's specific to them and we feed it back to them, right? So we, do, we don't normally go to like um, the end citizen and say, hey, listen, we, we optimized your unemployment insurance response or we optimized the Department of Health COVID response. We let you know the customer agency do whatever they want with that. But other, we have a lot of other um, RPA implementations happening now. Um, they're getting scaled up. A lot of them we're seeing now, certainly for FOIA requests, um, document processing, things like that, which takes a you know, fairly tedious amount of time. Of time yeah. We're seeing it deployed there. We're deploying it in Vita as well as two or three other agencies um, to really speed up that process. And then the other place we're seeing it is there's some of these agencies that do sort of licensing for citizens in certain professions, like I, you know, health professions and you know, certain things like that. 
we're using RPA to automate a lot of the checks and balances that happen in those processes. And then what will that ultimately do for the citizen is that's going to speed up the time they get through the process, get their license and be able to do what they need to do with that professionally. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me follow up on, on David's question and then uh, uh, let's uh, bring in a um, question from the audience here. And uh, uh, one is from, first one is from Brian Center. Um, he's asking, is your AI slash ML implementation through UiPath or you are using a different tool for that? And uh, are the other states consulting with you already? Sure. So um, we have been consulting with a number of states. Um, they've reached out. We had a, um, there's a, there's a national form called NASIO. It's the National Association of State CIOs. And um, they've sort of reached out to us saying, tell us about the service, how you're doing it and things like that. And then they just had, I think like a week, week or two ago, um, they had the, the, um, the annual get together for NASIO down in Seattle. So my team and myself, we did have a lot of conversations and presentations to our other public sector technology leaders to say, this is a service you may wanna look into. It's really served a lot of benefits for us. And, and the thing we've noted is some of these other states, it, it's not that we're the first one to do RPA, right? We're the first one to do it in an enterprise way end to end, yeah. right? So that's the thing, like you, you have in New York, for example, they're not using RPA statewide, but what they're doing is in certain pockets, like the, you know, the unemployment insurance, they're doing it there. Right. So what we've given the other states guidance on is to how to make this thing, you know, a, a broader service with a better intake funnel that can scale to meet the needs of the different agencies that use service. Right. And I think the other question was um, regarding UiPath. Right now, UiPath has been an excellent partner. Um, when we deployed the or when we initially had the concept of the service, right, we did a whole partner selection process similar to what we're doing with AI and machine learning. Um, there's a variety of AI and machine learning tools you can select. There's a lot of companies like IBM and Google and things like that that have commercially available tools that are good. You, you have to figure out what's the best fit for what you're trying to do. And um, we chose UiPath after going through that rigorous process because, and this will get a little bit more technical. I, I promised you, uh, Doran, I wasn't going to get too technical, but I have to get a little bit technical. Um, so, you know, there, there's, diff there's a lot of very good RPA tools out there. Right. And, you know, all of them have, you know, benefits and drawbacks. The UiPath solutions are, you know, they're very scalable, right? They have a very high level of expertise. But the thing is, they have a very good capability with what they like to call attended bots and unattended bots, right? So, like, for example, RPA on my laptop, I can have an attended bot, meaning I click something, I click a button, the bot does something for me, right? But I can also have a bot running on a server that when certain things happen, it just takes action, right? And UiPath has a capability of both. So what we, di we didn't wanna limit ourselves to say, we only wanna do attended or we only wanna do unattended. We wanna have a partner that had a very high level capability in both. And then the other part of it that really um, led us to UiPath is that, you know, right now the way it works, I mean, you know, Virginia has gone totally to the cloud. You know, we have AWS in our environment. We have Microsoft Azure in our environment. We have Oracle Cloud in our environment. And UiPath works with different cloud orchestrators, you know, when you're interacting, particularly for the unattended bots. You're, you're able to have basically, um, you know, cloud agnostic, which was important to us. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't want to be lo locked into like one cloud solution um, to really orchestrate these unattended bots. Um, so that's really what drove like the, the partnership and the decision with UiPath. And we're very happy with them to date. And John, you spoke of the kind of cultural, not resistance, but the cultural inability to adjust for a lot of people in the public sector. And we talked about marketing, you know, just market the heck out of them, tell them why it's good for them. What else did you guys do, if anything, to help educate them on moving to this technology and why it was a good thing for them personally or for their agency? Well, I mean, part of it is, if you remember the four-stage transformation roadmap, right? The last phase was to be the strategic technology partner and advisor, right? Now, part of that is, like, we have a group of people under me. Uh, they typically were called the customer account managers. There's one of them assigned per agency, 
So, you know, they're supposed to be like the face of Vita to that agency, right? Right. They traditionally have been, um, you know, very much more customer service, which in my mind, I hear customer service, it's very transactional. Like if I, if I have a, you know, a computer or a TV, I go to Best Buy, it didn't work. Here you go. I'm not asking that person at the customer service desk what the best solution is for me. I, I just want to get my card refunded for the, you know, the issue. And that's how Vita used to be. Um, it was only, only when you had a problem is when you would talk to us and things like that. So we refocused as part of this transformation, those folks into, and we have excellent people over there. I mean, their skills are outstanding, interpersonal and technical, um, but we refocused them on customer success, right? And, and we drove that message from almost the first month I got here saying, we're not focused on customer service anymore. We're focused on customer success. And, you know, what does that mean? Well, what that means is their job is not to handle escalations anymore. Their job is to get really deep with knowledge of their particular agencies that they're, that they're assigned to and understand what their business objectives are, what problems are they experiencing, what are the strategic objectives, and be able to identify opportunities to use the solutions and then be able to evangelize those solutions. So to answer your question, we use that customer success construct where you know these uh, these customer success managers, they have a deep level of intel into some of the needs and some of the pain points of our customers, right? They're able obviously to rely on the marketing and the white papers that we've developed from the other successful cases, but then they're able to say to them, let's set up like a intake, just analysis. You're having problem with this, you know, FOIA process. You're having problems with this document intake process. You're having problems with this benefits review process. This can actually help that tremendously. Let's, let's see what we can do here. And they've built a lot of trust. So we really try to attack it, not only in the like marketing, just to say like top down, like here's a message coming from me, and then we'll throw some testimonials in there. Here's a message from the, you know, the head of Department of Health. Here's a message from DMV, you know, and they'll, they'll listen to that. But then we also try to uh, attack that, the problem from a very personal aspect. And we try to say, this, this customer success, or we call them CAMs, this CAM has a relation with you. You trust them. You have a very good relationship with them. They're espousing you uh, these certain benefits of this solution, and they're touching on certain pain points in part of their pitch. And you know, we've really attacked it from multiple angles to really sort of drive up interest and then ultimately drive up more and more consumption of the service. Excellent. That's great. Let me, how about I take another question uh, from the audience, David? you mind? Yeah, I think this is uh, actually we have a few of them. Uh, so how about the first one? Do, do agencies have to purchase developers from Vita or are they able to do their own development job? Well, if they're going from the service, we have multiple like uh, companies. So what we've do, what we've done here with the service, like I said, we had an army of developers that can scale up or down. So we have right now two particular companies that both provide developers certified to do this type of thing for UiPath. Right. One of the companies specializes in highly complex bot implementations. So like you have, for example, you look in the toolbox, I need a drill or I need a screwdriver. I have one right there. But then the other one specializes in smaller or medium sized um, implementations. Right. So they can pick out of those. Now, certainly, you know, we're not going to stop them from using our license to just if they want to bring in another developer on a, let's say, a contingent labor contract. But we try to avoid that because, you know, part of our thing is that, you know, we want to make sure the outcome is achieved and the customer is happy and they get the outcomes like they get basically a positive return on investment. So if they use a developer that's not certified, then I can't guarantee the outcome. Right. That's a variability that I'm trying to avoid. So, you know, wh while we don't heavily restrict that, we do, you know, we do want to really give them enough options to where they don't need to do that. And then they have everything sort of within the confines of the service to be able to get the most out of it, stand it up, test it, deploy it, and then, you know, ultimately start seeing some of the business outcomes and benefits. So we have five minutes left from the top of the hour. So maybe we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, how about quickly this one that we have from the audience? Um, are you seeing an improvement in employee morale and or job satisfaction from this? Uh, we are. So, and this is also one of the ones that we um, sort of slightly touched upon for our, um, you know, organizational inertia. 
there was initially some fear about implementing this. You're like, you know, you're trying to automate people out of jobs. You know what I mean? You're, 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 and it's like, no, 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 we're not, we're not actually trying to do that. We're trying to eliminate the tedious stuff so you can really focus on what your skills actually are and do these higher level tasks. So, and now that, that's why the testimonials were also important because they're not just hearing it from me, they're hearing other agencies to say, for example, the Department of Health, they didn't let anybody go. They refocused their people on higher level activities to really facilitate much more effective resource allocation and COVID response based on where the outbreaks were. Um, I can tell you with Vita, we were one of the use cases. Um, you know, with us, you know, the morale and the finance group is very high. And now it's actually you know, quite a bit happier because now I'm not having to almost go blind looking at spreadsheet after spreadsheet in a month <laughs> um, to try to reconcile that, you know, I can get this done in a mere minutes and then really focus on more, you know, more intellectually stimulating type of things, more creative things like saying, let's see what this consumption trend is for this service. Hey, we, we may want to put in additional budget for this, or we may want to watch this. And it really focuses them more on financial analysis and high level analysis and forecasting versus the sort of nuts and bolts of having to do a manual reconciliation. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great. Here is one more. Um, are you building your automations internally via the COE or AOM, or is it a hybrid, mo hybrid model using a partner? Is that the long-term vision? So right now, yes, we are building the automations through the center of excellence. So every automation we've implemented, the center of excellence has a record of it. And, and keep in mind, you know, that's an important aspect of the service. Right. Because, you know, I, I want to be able to when we identify a case, I want to be able to do like for like. I want to be able to not only have a learning service, but I want to be able to speed up future implementations. So just to give a very you know, clear answer on this and to give you an example, um, you know, we had one agency use and start going forward with the automation and their licensing verification process. Citizen comes in, has to fill in licensing paperwork, you know, certain checks and balances happen. Something comes out. A second agency came in for a very similar use case. Why couldn't we use the same bot with some minor configuration and meet the same need and then also speed up the time to market? Um, and that, that's worked out pretty well for us. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, David, uh, any last comments before we, we, we close? We're two minutes before the top of the hour. You have any questions? Yeah. Uh, no, I just want to, I'll throw it back to you, Jordan, to close it all out, but I just want to thank John. John, this was terrific. You really provide a lot of knowledge. I think the more, as you say, the more people who know about RPA, AI, how it can be used in the public sector, how it can be beneficial to all the stakeholders, including the taxpayers and the people who work inside these agencies, to put them to higher value organizational objectives, I think is really exciting and will frankly sweep the country as we continue to know more about it. So thank you very much for sharing all this information with us today. Dorn and I'll throw it back to you because I know you want to mention something else that's coming up. Yes, but before that, I uh, also want to thank John for uh, uh, his incredible insights here today and thanks for sharing uh with with us and being a great steward and not uh, uh being a uh, you know adopter of that seven words rule that we have always done it this way and you you went to the eighth one and we have not yes. always done it that way so i Put really like that yeah that's exactly right but here's something before we leave uh, for the audience um i want to highlight with you uh, also invite you to engage with us in case uh, you want to learn more about what we do at the RPA initiative here at the Shaw School of Policy and Government by uh, um, going to our uh, website that was we'll shared with you a little bit earlier um, and also uh, to uh, download our research paper, which I believe would be very valuable for uh, everybody here. In case you haven't done so, you still can find it there. And this is um, our next event, which is coming out uh, uh, in a few weeks. Um, we're going to have our special guest, um, uh, Honorable Keith Kraft, the former CEO of DocuSign and founder, uh, also under Secretary of State, um, uh, which will we learn some great insights, uh, leadership insights in technology uh, um, and uh, business and government. Um, the link is provided uh, uh, in the chat box. And that's all what we have to say for today. Thanks very much for all uh, for attending. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Have a great day and uh, stay well. All the Thank best. Well. Thank you.
And thank, thank you, John, again. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.